Hello, everyone. Good to be with you again for our adult Sunday school lesson. This week we are in the book of Hebrews, and this will be the last lesson in the unit that focuses on Jesus's priesthood. Um, that has been the theme of this particular section of the gospel project. And granted, I don't typically reflect on those titles very much, but uh, it's very difficult not to in this particular grouping of passages that we're going to be focusing on. And so uh, the title that I've given, you can see toward the bottom of the screen, Jesus, the Superior Priest and Sacrifice. Uh, <clears throat> so let's just go ahead and read from chapter seven and nine. And then after that, we'll dig into that. So starting in chapter seven, verses 23 through 28. Now, many have become Levitical priests since they were prevented by death from remaining in office. But because he, that being Jesus, remains forever. Oh, sorry. He holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him. Since he always lives to intercede for them. For this is the kind of high priest that we need. Holy, innocent undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as high priests do, first for his own sins, then for those of the people. He did this once for all time when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak, but the promise of the oath which came after the law appoints a son who has been perfected forever. And then in chapter 9, verses 11 through 14, But Christ has appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come. In the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. He entered the most holy place once for all time, not by the blood of bulls and goats, I'm sorry, goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the goats of, sorry, for if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow, sprinkling those who are defiled, sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our consciousnesses from dead uh, works so that we can serve the living God? Pray with me. Jesus, our King, Lord, we give you praise for your mercy, your love, your goodness, for which you have walked us, shepherded us through yet another week. Lord, we are so grateful. So grateful that you renew your mercies for us each and every day. Lord, as we have been drawn to this place and time, I pray that you would open our minds and our understanding to the book of Hebrews, which is always challenging for us in many ways. Lord, whatever it is that you have prepared for us, may we receive it. Lord, may it strengthen our faith. May it challenge us in our walk as disciples with you. And may it show us the path that we must walk. Help us to better understand what we must about you so that we may love you more dearly. Lord, I ask these things in your name that you be glorified. Amen. So again, Jesus, the superior priest, sacrifice. I'm going to back up for a little bit in chapter 11 so that we can at least appreciate the context a bit better. And the goal behind what I want to accomplish with our study today is more or less to ask some deeper questions um, and to appreciate Jesus's priesthood in a way that oftentimes it's not very easy to do with just reading other material from the New Testament, because it's not quite so on the nose with it as the writer of Hebrews is. And of course, the writer of Hebrews is doing so, at least the, the, the consensus seems to be that the writer of Hebrews is focusing on this material as he is because of the fact these Christians, most likely in Jerusalem, are contemplating, perhaps, the concept of whether or not they've made the right choice in following Jesus. Or if maybe it's not so much following Jesus, it's whether or not they have left behind aspects of Judaism in such a way that they are not participating in the sacrificial occultic system anymore. It's difficult to know because there's not really a very clean-cut, framed-up circumstance the writer is addressing. It's piecemeal throughout you know, this tractate, whether you want to call it a letter or some have called it a sermon, various other titles given to it. Point being, there seems to be a group of Jewish believers who are following Jesus and that are distressed in some way and are certainly suffering persecution. And these are, these are the things the author wants to challenge. And of course, what he's challenging is the fact that Jesus is far away and above, more superior to anything that has defined Jewish life 
and customs for the entirety of their existence. And the fact that he is in every way able to meet the things that they have always been looking for as a people. And there's no need to continue to cling to the things that, as the author says, <sighs> so, they're passing away. So without embellishing anymore, let's go to chapter 7 and verse 11, where the author says, Now, if perfection came through the Levitical priesthood, for on the basis of it, the people received the law, then what further need was there for another priest to appear, said to be according to the order of Melchizedek and not according to the order of Aaron? So this is one thing that we immediately need to ask ourselves. When it comes to the cultic system of worship in the Old Testament, and that being everything that was prescribed to come to the altar to be offered, whether we're talking animals or grain offerings or wine to be poured out, if there was a means of achieving complete and total redemption through the atoning sacrifices that could be given there, then what need would there have been for Jesus to uh, appear? Now, of course, on the, the surface of that, we would say, well, clearly it wasn't perfect. It wasn't complete. Jesus was necessary. But sometimes I think we may miss something very critical when it comes to evaluating that from the perspective of what do we assume these offerings actually accomplished? Lots of times we really don't bother taking any, any real length of time to go through those sacrifices as prescribed in the first seven chapters of Leviticus and then appreciate what it was that it's being spoken of there that they were intended to cover or accomplish. And then again, we go further into Leviticus right at the very heart of it in Leviticus 16 and evaluate it with the same question in mind. What was the day of atonement supposed to achieve? So we're going to talk about some of those things in greater detail in our time together to try to answer some of those questions so that again what was the deed for jesus so genesis chapter 2 verse 15 we understand that god created the man and after coronating him as king in chapter 1 telling him to rule and subdue we then see the creation story from a different angle where there is no man to work the ground and so god plants a garden eastward in the province of Eden, and it's often called the Garden of Eden. And then outside the garden, God made the man. He breathed life into him, and then he takes the man, and he puts him in the garden. And it says explicitly that he was placed there to work and watch over it. And so those words, work and watch in Hebrew, abad and shamar, as we've talked about numerous times before, coming to us, Again, in Numbers 3 and 13, or I'm sorry, uh, 18, are spoken in a context that deals exclusively with what's going on inside the tabernacle. And the charge is given to Aaron and all the priests and Levites that they are responsible for everything that occurs, both good and bad, inside the walls of the tabernacle, because they are supposed to work and watch over it. And so if that's the case, we have to take those terms and reflect backwards, in a sense, to what Adam was being called to do in the garden, understanding that he was not simply to just <clears throat> plant new gardens um, or expand on the garden because the garden itself uh, itself would seemingly take care of that. Adam was supposed to guard and watch and keep, presumably, the wisdom that God was sharing with him because he, as this king priest, was clearly going to be filling the earth multiplying uh, the amount of image bearers that was going to be coming from him. And if the ultimate goal was to achieve what God tells Malachi, Malachi 1, 11, that sacrifice and offering would be, and incense will be burnt to him in every place, essentially where the sun touches, so that his glory would fill the earth. This is what Adam was supposed to do. Not the sacrifice would have necessarily been required, of course, because there would have been no need for atonement had Adam been obedient. But as Adam was not, we clearly see uh, that was the alteration or the evolution of that goal. But the end outcome is the same, that ultimately God's glory is going to fill the earth. As Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 11, as the water fills the sea. So with that, we have a king priesthood that is first established as a precedent for us in Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Okay, 
So then we'll go to 1 Samuel chapter 2 in two different places that spans a pretty lengthy scope of time where we have Hannah's prayer after she is assured by Eli the priest that she is going to bear this child she's praying for. And as she concludes her prayer, she says, the Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give power to his king. He will lift up the horn of his anointed. Then later, when this boy Samuel is of age where he can faithfully share the prophecy that God has given him to speak to the debauchery of Eli's house and priesthood. This is what Samuel tells Eli. Then I will raise up a faithful priest for myself. Notice the language here. This priest will do what is ever in my heart and mind, which seems to suggest, if we know the story of David well, uh, that David may have been the fulfillment of this, rather than the priest who actually comes after Eli and his household is wrecked. And more on that in a second. But this priest will do whatever is in my heart and mind. I will establish a lasting dynasty for him, which again, when we get to the crescendo moment of David's story in 2 Samuel 7, the, there is a promise of a lasting dynasty for him. In reality, from beginning to end, as goes the books of Samuel and Kings, there really isn't the establishment of a priesthood, per se, in which we get this dynastic concept that's uh, isolating one house of Aaron above another house, in which we actually find these remaining words fulfilled, where he will walk before my anointed for all time. Anyone who is left in your family will come and bow down to him for a piece of silver or a loaf of bread. He will say, please anoint me, uh, appoint me some priestly office so that I may have a piece of bread to eat. And there's a lot of scholarly discussion around this, and many will say that far flung in the future, there will become uh, a moment where a priest named Zadok, who expresses fidelity um, to David, and of course, the God that David and his house serves, that Zadok and his family will be isolated as the perpetual priests that will minister before the Lord for all time. And that very well could be a layer of fulfillment of this. But as goes the immediate context, again, it seems that David is the fulfillment of this because Eli has a descendant named Abiathar, the last remaining descendant of his house, who will serve David faithfully for most of his days until the time comes when David is old and uh, Solomon is the one who needs to be installed as king. And then, of course, there's this debacle where another son is vying for kingship, and Abiathar actually sides with Adonijah rather than siding with Solomon, who has already been pre-selected as the succeeding heir to David. And so with that, Abiathar is judged, and the prophecy that Samuel speaks of here is indeed exacted upon the last surviving member of Elijah's house, who is serving as high priest. Because Abiathar is the one who takes that ephod from Nob when Saul and the band of men he brings with him comes to exact judgment on those priests who had helped David by giving him assistance and who were living in Nob at the time. And so with that, Abiathar escapes. He has the ephod and he serves as priest for a time, but not so much, I think, at least in the tabernacle sense, because, of course, the temple's not built during the life of David. And Abiathar is slain shortly after the, uh, the successor to David takes the throne. And Zadok is also installed to serve as a priest at the same time that Abiathar is. And so it seems that Abiathar never really wears the mantle of high priest. And Zadok does for a time. And of course, his sons will uh, continue on after him. And that progenitor right of dynastic um, rule or uh, sharing of the high priesthood. So in a sense, there is some fulfillment there with Zadok. But the point I want to make with this very clearly, though, is there's lots of language that is echoed multiple times throughout the books of Samuel that clearly speak to this being a bit more akin to David than it is any other high priest. And the point I want to really make with all of this is drawing it back to Hebrews chapter 7, that here in that context, we clearly see that Jesus is the actual priest who is after the order of Melchizedek, defining a new priesthood that is not one that is descended after Aaron, which this whole biblical concept of there being priests other than the priesthood of Aaron, that is seemingly superior to the priesthood of Aaron, is actually rooted in the concept of Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, of a priest king 
who is supposed to rule over God's creation and represent God before this creation and this creation before the Lord. All right. So then we go to Hebrews 7, 15 through 16. And this becomes clearer if another priest like Melchizedek appears, who did not become a priest based on a legal regulation about physical descent, but based on the power of an indestructible life, for it's been testified. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. This, of course, coming from the 110th Psalm, which we, if we go back and read that, we'll get a little bit more clarity, because David extols this. This is the declaration of the Lord to my Lord. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord will extend your scepter from Zion. Rule over your surrounding enemies. Your people will volunteer on the day of battle in your holy splendor from the womb of the dawn. The dew of your youth belongs to you. The Lord has sworn an oath and will not take it back. You are a priest forever, according to the pattern of Melchizedek. But what we clearly see here is that there's more than just being a priest involved here, because the psalm starts out with this militaristic language of conquest in which a conquering king is the one who is told to sit at the right hand of Yahweh until the Lord makes his enemies his footstool. So this is a priest king, which it seems to be written with David in the forefront, albeit these are the words that David is writing, and he is writing it about a person who he deems to be even mightier than he is, <clears throat> because this is the very psalm that Jesus loves to quote more than any other psalm, and other New Testament writers for that matter. It's the very one he points to that he uses to stump all the groups who come to him at the end of the Passion Week, where after that they don't ask him any more questions and instead retreat to their schemes to try to put him to death. When he says, Messiah, whose son is he? And they say, David's. Well, how is it that, that David calls him Lord when he says, the Lord said it to my Lord, sit into my, at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Hmm. So that being said, there's clearly a prophecy in place here in which this messianic descendant of David is supposed to rule as king as he did, but he's also supposed to serve as priest. How can he do both? When you stop the story and think about it, though, there was a time in which David actually exemplified a measure of this, kind of going back to that theme rooted early in the psalm. I'm sorry, rooted early in the book of Samuel. And that is when you see David actually bringing the Ark of the Covenant into the tent that he pitched for it, something of an, a, an extension of the tabernacle in the city of Jerusalem that he had just recently conquered and is now declared at his, as his both political and religious capital. He is wearing an ephod like a priest would, and he is singing and dancing with tambourines in front of the actual tabernacle. I'm sorry, the uh, Ark of the Covenant. And as he is the one leading the procession, when they get it right on the second attempt, every six paces, they are stopping and they are sacrificing a burnt offering there. And so there's a lot of priestly work involved in what David is doing. With that being said, what we should clearly appreciate here is that not only is this in some way fulfilling what was being spoken of earlier in the book of Samuel, but it's the ultimate pattern that God wants fulfilled in the Messianic liver, of which David, of course, was a prototype of, and in many ways fulfilled that mold, but in his fall through his own in, uh, embarrassing rebellion against the Lord, we clearly see he's not the one who was supposed to ultimately stand in that place. His descendant would instead. And we go back to another portion of Hebrews 7, where it says in verses 18 through 22, so the previous command is annulled. That previous command, of course, being the one in which Aaron is supposed to rule as high priest. And the reason why is because it's weak. It's unprofitable for the law itself can do nothing. But a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And none of this happened without an oath for others became priests without an oath. But he became a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Because of this oath, Jesus also became the guarantee of a better covenant. So this is leading us back to the question that we're asking at the beginning of this lesson. And in what way is Jesus more superior to these basal elements as far as this priesthood that was always meant to fade away and give way to him? The incarnational aspect of God's salvific and redemptive plan, which in reality was always part of the goal, not so much the salvation piece of it as much as the incarnational piece of it. God wanting to dwell with those who he had made to bond with 
and to share in his rule and authority with. Now that they had sinned and the rebellion had caused distance between them and God, God now has to redeem them. But the idea is that he's still going to incarnate himself amongst them and in the process, redeem them unto himself once again. So even though the idea of Adam's priesthood originally did not encompass this concept of redemption because it wasn't needed, now it does. Because the next thing we see Adam doing after he's outside the garden is apparently teaching his children how to offer these sacrifices as we transition over the story of Cain and Abel. And so now it's this priestly duty has taken on a redemptive concept behind it. Anyway, point being, in what way is Jesus more superior than these? And what was the need for him to come and do these things if he uh, or if it in and of itself was complete and did not need something more than what he could offer? So we go down to verse 28. He doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as high priests do. Doesn't need to offer sacrifices every day as high priests do, first for their own sins and then for those of the people. Now, this is where we'll need to start exploring other portions of the Old Testament to get a better feel for what's actually being said here. Because if we're not careful, what we'll walk away from here with is the idea that this was actually what was operative in the Old Testament. Now, I have to caveat what I'm saying here with the possibility that it very well may have been. And I'm going to specify here in a second what I mean. But if we actually are careful when we go back and read the Old Testament to pay attention to the details, we do not have a construct in which priests are offering sacrifices for their own sins every day. We're not told that's what they're supposed to do. In fact, the only actual moment in which we have uh, priests offering sacrifices first for their own sins and then for the people actually uh, occurs on the Day of Atonement. So we're left with at least one of two options. Is the writer of Hebrews mistaken here? And I would say certainly not. Perhaps there is a mechanism in place that has evolved over time in which priests are doing this, even though it was not established as a precedent per se in the Old Testament. And they are adding to what was there, all for the sake of attempting to try to be more holy or whatever the case might be. Or he's actually doing something different, and that is he's telescoping this concept on top of something else. Maybe that's what's going on here in case in case in point, if we read over in Exodus 29, maybe we'll get a better feel for what he's actually referring to here. Sorry. This is what is said in Exodus 29, and of course, this is before the tabernacle is even constructed. This is what you were to offer regularly on the altar every day. So these are, at a minimum, the offerings that will be given over every single day, regardless of who or what will come to be offered at any other point between the dawn and, of course, twilight. Two year old lambs in the morning offer one lamb at twilight offer the other lamb so we have a lamb and with the first offer two quarts of fine flour mixed with olive oil so we know that of course this is a grain offering and so now we have meat and unleavened bread as we understand from leviticus chapter 2 all grain offerings regardless of how they're prepared must be finished as unleavened bread and then you would offer the second lamb at twilight offer a grain offering and a drink offering with it like the one in the morning, as a pleasing aroma, a food offering to the Lord. And as we understand, of course, it is a burnt offering. So with that, all of the food itself will be consumed on the altar. None of it is to be shared by the priests. And the fact remains that because we have both meat and unleavened bread, and this, essentially we have a Passover here, uh, as goes a Passover sacrifice being offered every morning and every evening. And as we talked about this in recent weeks, we do not necessarily need to rehash what exactly that means. But when we go back and actually reread once again what the purpose of the burnt offering was here, then we understand there is an extra piece to this that's going on. If the priest is offering this year old lamb every morning and every evening as a burnt offering, then Leviticus 1 tells us if the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he is to bring an unblemished male. He will bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting so that he may be accepted by the Lord. And he is to lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering so it can be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. So one can readily argue here that what's going on here in Hebrews chapter 7 is that the writer is saying that the priests were offering up sacrifices first for themselves and then for the people every morning in the form of this burnt offering uh, in which we have a lamb being 
first slain and then placed on the altar in the prescriptive manner and offered up <clears throat> uh, by the priest. However, there's a lot of subtle nuances here that we're passing over. Number one, this burnt offering is not specified to be for the priest in Exodus 29. It is offered by the priest, but nothing there says contextually it's for the priest. And of course, in the context of Hebrews chapter 7, we have two offerings because we have one that's offered first for the priest for his own sins, then for the people. Granted, Exodus 29 says there are two animals being slain separately, but there are only two different offerings in which one animal and e in each offering is being slain. So if that's the case, two uh, lambs are not given over in the morning and the evening. It's just one. Now, granted, in Exodus 29, with respect to the morning and evening offering, uh, the presumption would have to be that it's offered in the way that Leviticus chapter 1 would specify, as goes the animal portion of it. And that is, the priest has to lay a hand on the animal. But what we should not presume there is that the priest is <clears throat> declaring any measure of sinfulness over the animal itself. In other words, as I've spoken of more than a, a year and a half ago, I would presume at this point, when we were discussing portions of Leviticus, what we should not do is superimpose portions of Leviticus, Leviticus on top of another. In other words, many of us are probably far more familiar with the context of Leviticus chapter 16, the Day of Atonement, in which, as we've heard in sermons and lessons, the high priest will take his hands and place them on top of the head of the goat, the goat that's supposed to be sent off into the wilderness, and by virtue of that, confess the sins of the people over the goat, and this goat will bear those sins off into the wilderness to Azazel, where this goat will never be seen again and given over to this place of chaos or whatever Azazel is supposed to represent. And so when we see the concept, the context of a priest placing hands on top of an animal, the presumption would be that there is a confession of sin over top of the animal and then the animal itself will bear that sin. But we have introduced an even greater problem here. When we read the actual verses of Aaron presenting the bull for his own sin offering, making atonement for himself and his household, which would go back and fit very nicely in with Hebrews chapter 7 here because he's offered up a sacrifice for his own sins first. Next, he will take the two goats, place them before the Lord at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And Aaron will cast lots for the two goats, one for the lot of the Lord and another for the uninhabitable place, that being Azazel. And he is to present the goat chosen by Lot for the Lord and sacrifice it as a sin offering. So here in Leviticus chapter 16, what we're seeing here is that there's two goats being chosen. One will be sacrificed. That's the goat for the Lord. But it's to be sacrificed and prepared as a sin or kata, purification offering, not as a burnt offering. And when we go and read Leviticus chapter 4, we understand that there are actually different things going on with a purification offering than a burnt offering because elements of the blood will be taken into the tabernacle and will be used to anoint different things to cleanse it from the iniquity that has come about by the actions of either a person or a group of people, depending upon <clears throat> the uh, type of animal being, animal being offered and, of course, where the blood is going to be utilized. That being said, what we don't have with the burnt offering is any element of the animal going past the actual altar where it's being sacrificed. No uh, blood is to be taken inside of the tabernacle and used to cleanse anything. And better yet, the goat that's actually slain is not bearing the sins of the people or anybody for that matter. The goat that's being slain that's meant to uh, atone for, uh, I'm sorry, I mean, I was about to <laughs> say the wrong thing. The goat that's actually being used to bear the sins of the people is the goat that's being sent off into the wilderness. The goat that's being slain, as I said, is supposed to be taking care of the iniquity of the people. And of course, we're going to have to add a bit of a caveat to that here in just a second. But this does not fit neatly either into what the writer of Hebrews is actually saying. Because, granted, uh, an offering is being offered for his own sins and then the, those for the people on the Day of Atonement. But this is not something that's going on every single day. Rather, it's only occurring one day of the year. We go a little deeper into Leviticus and we understand in verses 15 and 16, when he slaughters the male goat for the people's sin offering and brings its blood inside the curtain, he will do the same thing 
with its blood as he did with the bull's blood. He is to sprinkle it against the mercy seat in front of it. He will make atonement for the most holy place in this way for all the sins because of the Israelites' impurities and rebellious acts. He will do the same for the tent of meeting that remains amongst them, amongst them because it is surrounded by their impurities. And then a few verses later, when he's finished making atonement for the most holy place, the tent of meeting and the altar, he is to present the live male goat. Aaron will lay both his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the Israelites' iniquities and rebellious acts, all their sins. He is to put them on the goat's head, send it away to the wilderness by the man appointed for the task. The goat will carry away all their iniquities into a desolate land, and the man will release it there. So, appreciating the Day of Atonement sacrifice a little better, I think what we're supposed to ultimately understand from that is, number one, the target for what is supposed to be atoned for and purified is actually the holy place the holy place and the most holy place inside the precinct of the tabernacle because that's where the blood is going to be taken and the blood is going to be sprinkled all over everything that's required for the priest to sprinkle it on and this is ultimately to cleanse it from the iniquities of the people now granted we must recall the people aren't going inside the tabernacle but their sin-bearing high priest per exodus chapter 28 is going into the high place uh, or the holy place and he is bearing their sins and iniquities in there and not because they've touched him and defiled him but it's just by virtue of the fact that they've done what they've done and he by virtue of his role is taking their sins upon himself and because he is in that space he is defiling it by virtue of his presence in there even though he has performed the daily ritual washings and whatever so there's really no way to keep the holy place and most holy place from being tainted and of course, in Leviticus 4, these sin offerings can be offered at any given time of the year. There's not a requirement to only offer it on the Day of Atonement. But the Day of Atonement is meant to take care of everything that's happened. Maybe since the last time a sin offering was made, or of course, because sin offerings can be given by individuals or on the part of groups of people or all of the nation per se, which of course would happen ritualistically on the Day of Atonement, there could be moments in between those offerings or since the last day of atonement when all of this hasn't really been taken care of on the part of all of the people but there's nothing said here specifically in leviticus 16 in which this particular sacrifice is supposed to be sufficient for taking away all the sins of the people now you may challenge that by saying he is going to confess over the the goat that's going to go out into the wilderness all the sins of the people so how could that not take care of all the sins of the people and i would say Here's the reason we would know that's not the case, because Jesus came. If the Day of Atonement could be enough of a prescriptive remedy to take care of all the sins of the people, then what would be the purpose of Jesus coming? One could argue, well, because, of course, he would be a far superior sacrifice. And instead of having to do this one day out of the year every year, he could do it once for all time, and therefore it's taken care of. Or because this cultic rite is only meant for Israel, it's not meant for any other nation, although I would suggest that can be challenged by virtue of the fact the goal behind what the promise to Abraham was was to make him a father of many nations. And so the nations would come alongside Israel and join in with this pra practice. So if the nations were allowed to participate, if the goal of Israel was ultimately realized, then I don't think we can argue that as a point as goes this was only for Israel. Jesus' sacrifice opened the gate for all nations to partake in this. Better yet, why didn't Jesus die on the Day of Atonement rather than dying at the time of Passover, even though there are elements of the Day of Atonement baked into what he did through his crucifixed, uh, that's not a right, uh, proper word, through his, the act of his crucifixion in that Passion Week. If that system of sacrifice not properly atone then there would be a need for something greater and of course there was something greater so then what was the purpose of the day of atonement what could it actually achieve what sins did it not cover of course when we read of the sins of what is called high-handedness that's what the actual hebrew words mean when we talk about sins of willful deliberate rebellion on the part of a person say of murder or adultery those types of sins that would be met with capital punishment how could those sins be forgiven? <clears throat> and the truth is, is that I don't think we find a prescriptive remedy for that anywhere in the Old Testament. In fact, if 
we just generically say if a person sinned, no matter what that sin was, they could come to the tabernacle or the temple. They could bring with them the proper animal. They could tell the priest what they're offering the animal for. They could place their hands on the head of the animal and confess that sin over the animal. And then that animal be offered in their place so that rather than they dying, the animal dies. The problem with that is, is God doesn't say that anywhere in the Old Testament, neither in Leviticus, nor does he say it anywhere where he is outlining any of those particular acts of willful rebellion or sins of high handedness in which he says, if a person is caught in the act of doing this, then that person is to be brought before the tabernacle, given the opportunity then to offer the right prescriptive animal to cover their sins. And if they refuse to do so, then you exact this punishment of death. There's no chance for redemption anywhere in this. They are to be brought before the community and then they are to be stoned to death. Or in other case, less extreme cases, they are to be cut off. But nowhere is it said that they get to then bring this animal and by virtue of confessing their sin over the animal and then slaying the animal on their part, the animal taking their punishment rather than they taking it themselves, they are set right with both God and man. No one can accuse them any longer and they get to continue to live in the precincts of Israel. And I don't think we're supposed to understand that with the Day of Atonement either, because if that was the case, I think it would be written a little bit more clearly that that is exactly what this particular sacrifice was supposed to do, is cover and cleanse all the sins of the people. Rather, what the target of it is, is to cleanse the high place or the holy places from the sins of the people. It really doesn't even say anything about the people being cleansed by virtue of this. There are other sacrifices, hence the sin offerings of Leviticus 4 and the guilt offerings of Leviticus 5 that are meant to more or less cleanse the people. But when you go back and read that chapter, what is the uniform word that is mentioned all throughout that is that this is for the unintentional sinful acts of the people. In fact, Leviticus 16 does nothing to actually go back and clarify that as if to say their sins of high handedness now get wrapped up in the sacrifice of the Day of Atonement and then all of their sins are cleansed. And if that person was to die, even though they had committed an act of adultery or uh, murder or something else that would have merited capital punishment, but they did not feel any remorse for it, they had not been yet caught for it, they had not confessed it before God nor asked and sought his forgiveness for it, and the Day of Atonement has come, they have been inadvertently cleansed by the actions of the high priest whether they sought that cleansing or not. And if they die, they are set right with God. God has nothing to lay at their charge now because that sin was forgiven and cleansed by virtue of the shedding of that animal's blood. That seemed to create a very severe uh, conflict with respect to what has been said in other places as to how God wanted those sins to be accorded and dealt with. So if that's the case, what we need here is something that is better, something that is superior, something that could actually cleanse the conscience of the person offering these sacrifices once for all. And we see David actually confessing this also in Psalm 51 when he says it's not that God wanted sacrifice for what he had done, his sins of murder and adultery. Or I should reverse those, adultery and murder. Rather, he wanted the sacrifice of a broken and contrite heart. If it was the blood of bulls and goats, he would have brought thousands of sacrifices. But I think David clearly recognized there was nothing he could offer God that would ultimately cleanse him of what it was that he had done. He needed God to create within him a clean and right heart. So going back to Hebrews in verse 28, for the law appoints as high priest men who are weak, but the promise of the oath which came after the law appoints a son who has been perfected forever. And of course, this beckons the language of Psalm 2, where it is said, I will declare the Lord's decree. He has said to me, the Lord saying to the Davidic descendant, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Ask of me, I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession, which of course, this is kingly language. But when we factor this back into Psalm chapter, or I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter seven, what we clearly see here is that this is bringing to pass the precedent of Genesis two, a priest king, or what is reflected in the foreshadowing of first Samuel chapter two of David who would arise very soon in the story, and of course, the Messiah who will descend from him, <clears throat> a priest king who will ultimately take care of what the Arianite priesthood was not capable of doing, even if they followed the law to a T and, and offered everything as prescribed. 
So now moving to Hebrews chapter 9, verses 12 and 13, Jesus entered the most holy place once for all time, not by the blood of goats and calves, but his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow, sprinkling those who are defiled, sanctify for the purification of the flesh, let's pause there for a second and just stop. <laughs> First of all, we have to uh, try to qualify what is being meant here by the blood of goats and bulls. Well, First of all, we go back to the Day of Atonement sacrifices, and it seems like what's going on there is that in chapter 7 and now 9, it seems that the writer of Hebrews really had the Day of Atonement in mind when he spoke about offering sacrifices for his own sins first, that being the priest, and then for the sins of the people, although he specified it was going on every day. In reality, those were the altar or the offerings of burnt offerings in the morning and the evening, and somehow those were telescoped on top of each other. And the reason why I would say that's important is because, again, the burnt offering seems to suggest a recapitulation of the Passover, both morning and evening, and a recognition that they are still in captivity, even if they are in the land doing everything that God requires and being perfectly obedient. The fact is, is God has not incarnated himself amongst them, and until that happens, they are in a measure still distant from him. They are on the other side of the cherubim where Adam has consiled them to by virtue of his sin. They need to be on the inside of the cherubim and back in perfect and right fellowship with God. And that day was going to come when God would incarnate himself and be amongst them in person. And the need for the cultic expression of these ritualistic sacrifices would no longer be needed. Rather, because he dwells amongst them, they can share in the fruitfulness of the feast of the kingdom rather than the Feast of Exile. That being said, <clears throat> what's going on in the Day of Atonement, too, is the concept of preventing exile from happening, because if they don't properly cleanse the holy place, then this is exactly what God is going to consign them to, is exile outside of the new province of Eden, when he will push them out of the land and cast them amongst the nations because they fail to take care of this very pivotal moment uh, in the liturgical year, which is supposed to inaugurate other things too, such as the year of Jubilee, the ultimate release from captivity in every sense. So with that being said, we also appreciate here a further di uh, dive into the Day of Atonement because that's when Aaron would use the blood of a bull for his own sin and then the blood of goats for the sins of the people. <clears throat> okay. And in both senses, the bull and the goat are being used as sin offerings to first purify himself and then ultimately purify the people. Um, or, I'm sorry, purify the holy place. Man, it's hard to even deconstruct that in my own mind and purge what I, I had previously <laughs> learned. Then he goes on to talk about the use of a young cow and the sprinkling of what has been defiled with its ashes. This comes to us from Numbers 19. You know, there's all this talk and hullabaloo about the need of red heifers for the sacrificial system to recommit in Israel. And I often find that a little odd because in reality, this is the only place that it comes to us from the Old Testament, Numbers 19. And when you read the context of that chapter, it's, it has nothing to do really at all with what's going on inside the tabernacle. Instead, the sacrifice seemingly uh, begins there, but it ends outside of the tabernacle when this is what is being told to them. The legal statute the Lord has commanded, instruct the Israelites to bring you an unblemished red cow that has no defect and has never been yoked. Give it to Eleazar, the priest. He will have it brought outside the camp and slaughtered in his presence. So the sacrifice itself doesn't even occur inside the, the tabernacle. The priest Eleazar is to take some of its blood with his finger and sprinkle it seven times toward the front of the tent of meeting. But of course, this is outside the tent, so it's nowhere inside it. It's not purifying inside uh, or anything inside the, the tabernacle, nor would it eventually the temple. The cow is to be burned in his sight. Its high flesh and blood are to be burned along uh, with its waist. The priest is to take some cedar wood, hyssop, and crimson yarn and throw them onto the fire where the cow is burning. And the priest who touches in, or the person who touches any human corpse will be unclean for seven days. So what's supposed to happen is the ashes that is collected from the remains of this sacrifice are to be kept in a clean place. And then when the necessity comes for making more of this water that will be used for purification, 
A priest will go and take some of these ashes and place them inside the water, mix them until they dissolve, of course, and this becomes the water for sprinkling for the purpose of purification. So when any person touches a human corpse, they will be unclean, notice here, for seven days. Obviously, the reason behind the uh, use of seven rather than six or eight or any other number is because this is to mimic the creation cycle. Because this person has been exiled from the camp, they can't go inside the camp due to their uncleanliness having handled a dead body. But once the seventh day comes and they are cleansed properly, then they can go back into camp. And it is as if they are being, in a sense, born anew back into the camp who is, uh, who that, where they've been absent from for a week. He is to purify himself with the water both on the third day and on the seventh day. Then he will be pronounced clean. If he does not purify himself on the third and seven days, he will not be clean. Anyone who touches the body of a person who has died and does not purify himself defiles the tabernacle of the Lord. So they defile the tabernacle of the Lord just by virtue of the fact that they exist now that they have not properly cleansed themselves. It's not saying they have to go inside the tabernacle in order to defile it. By virtue of the fact they are a defiled person inside the camp, they bring that iniquity into the tabernacle, which is part of the reason why why the Day of Atonement has to occur. So that in and of itself would tie us back to what's going on here in Hebrews chapter 9 with respect to the mentioning of all of this together, right? And that person will be cut off from Israel. He remains unclean because the water of impurity has not been sprinkled on him and his uncleanliness is still on him. So what we have here is the combination of the elements of the day of atonement plus the use of this water of purification for the sake of understanding the overarching thing and that is how impurity in and of itself creates the consequence of and the necessity for exile if it's not properly taken care of these people have allowed these impurities to build distance between them and the lord and ultimately to show the lord he is no longer welcome in the place that was meant for him to dwell in, and of course, for him to meet the people in. If we go back to Exodus chapter 29, that was part of what I had included there, because this is what the Lord says. This is will this will be your regular burnt offering throughout your generations at the entrance to the tent of meeting, where I will meet to, uh, you and speak with you. And then, of course, this is for all the people, right? So if they don't properly take care of that place and keep it cleansed and undefiled, the Lord will leave it. And when that happens, there will be no remedy for taking care of it at that point. Uh, the Lord will have left, and by virtue of that, the people will have to deal with the consequence of him no longer being present and the judgment he will turn them over to. The same can be said for what's going on here with respect to the use of the ashes of the heifer and sprinkling the dead person, uh, sprinkling, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sprinkling the, the body of the person who has handled another dead uh, person, all for the sake of ridding them of the exile they've been consigned to outside the, the camp and bringing them back in. The writer of Hebrews goes on to say, how much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our consciousnesses from dead works so that we may serve the living God? Ultimately, this is what I would tell you with respect to this lesson and why it matters. If the Old Testament system of sacrifice was good enough, there would have been no Jesus, uh, no reason for Jesus to come along and do what he did. Clearly, it wasn't that Jesus just showed up and immediately died, accomplished everything that he did through his passion, and then immediately left and went back to heaven. No, he came and lived amongst us for nearly 33 years, and in the last three years of his life, there was much that he accomplished before he capped that off with the moment of his death and subsequent resurrection. So there is certainly a more holistic nature to Jesus's life than just his death and resurrection. But without his death and resurrection, all of the rest of it would have been completely pointless. I think we all have to agree on it. So with that in mind, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 7 has capitalized very keenly on the idea that there were some built-in weaknesses to the Arianite priesthood and the covenant that God made with that priesthood that eventually had to be done away with in order to make room for this more superior priesthood that 
preceded the Arianite priesthood in the type given in Genesis 2, and as it was seen in the person of Melchizedek, which David, as the author of Psalm 10, is capturing when, of course, he perhaps is reflecting over his own life, and, of course, the one who will come after him that he terms his Lord, who was being spoken to by the Lord to come and sit at his right hand until he makes his enemies his footstool. So now Jesus, who is the one who is the priest after the order of Melchizedek has come, we see his sacrifice, which is himself, and the handling of that blood as the officiating priest in the tabernacle, not made with hands, but the one that it was patterned after. The tabernacle in the heavenlies is where he has taken this blood to present it before God, to not merely purify the holy place above, because the, that, in a sense, is what the Day of Atonement is meant to kind of somewhat capture is the need to purify holy place or the holy places here. But what was above was not in, uh, in need of purification. Rather, we, we, the new temple, or what was in need of purification so that we can become the proper habitable dwelling place for the Lord to come into. And by virtue of that, we understand that we have been cleansed from our dead works and we are now supposed to serve the living God, which is what the rest of the New Testament is really geared toward helping us better understand, which is what I would point you to when it comes to capturing more of the so what behind this lesson, if you're wondering. So thank you for listening, and I appreciate your attention, and I hope this has been helpful and informative in every way that it possibly could be. Lord Jesus, we thank you for our time together, and we just pray that you'll help us to make better sense of this in the way that only you can Lord, we are so grateful for your obedience and the fact that you have accomplished this on our behalf so that we may forever live unto you. You are you who are the priest over us as priests. May we serve you with diligent hearts, with humble minds, and with a willingness, Lord, to give you glory in all that we say and do. In your name we pray. Amen.